Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Did you tell somebody about Jesus this week? Anybody? Yeah, I did. You did? Okay. All right. Good. Good, good. Uh, how about uh, reading your Bible every day this past week? Anybody do that this week? Yeah. All right. Good. Good, good. Um, if you read the uh, uh, schedule that we're on, you would have been in Psalm 48 through 80 and Acts 25 through Romans 1. And you would have come across the answers to these uh, trivia questions. Psalm 51, you would have read this in the notes uh, preceding the psalm. Psalm 51 is a response to a great sin. Whose sin was it, and what was the sin? Psalm 51. All right. I'm going to guess David. All right, the psalmist, that's a good guess. <laughs> and you are good correct. <laughs> uh, adultery. It was adultery. It was, and murder. Uh, and murder, yeah. And murder, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, uh, Psalm 51 is a, a great example of a, uh, a prayer of repentance and uh, uh, just a beautiful, beautiful uh, text. Then in the New Testament, as Paul stood before a Roman governor, <clears throat> the Bible says that he reasoned of righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, and the governor trembled with fear. Who was the governor? Felix, Felix trembled. Uh, all right. And then back in the Old Testament, in the 73rd Psalm, uh, the psalmist said, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray for I envied the arrogant and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. What happened to change his perspective. It happens about halfway through the psalm when he's, uh, well, got to go all the way to the end to read this. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> he, uh, uh, in verse 16, he says, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me verse 17, until I went into the house of God. Then I understood their end. His perspective was changed because he went to church. You know, church has that influence on us. It changes us mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if we let it. All right, so we're in uh, Galatians chapter 4, and we're only going to deal with two verses today uh, because of the uh, import of, of what is being said here. Galatians chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Somebody read that for us. <laughs> My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Perplexed. Paul has uh, his initial responses in, in or the, the initial parts of the letter that he writes is coming from a heart that is broken, a heart that is enraged at what people are doing to the churches in Galatia and what the people are allowing to be done in the churches in Galatia. Um, and here he, he is beginning to soften his tone and he talks to the, them with these endearing words, my little children. Uh, why, why did Paul call the church members their little children. He, he wanted, I guess, to be in a childlike mind. Okay. 
wanted to be of a like mind. What are, what are children like? Innocent. innocent. They're innocent. They don't know much. They don't know much. That's a good summation of what uh, happens when folks are new in the faith. They don't, they don't know what they got. Uh, they don't know how it all happened. And they don't know much. And they're hungry for knowledge. And sometimes that uh, information comes that is not correct. And that's what was happening here. Uh, uh, Paul is, is, then he goes on to say, he says, I'm laboring as, as in childbirth for you. He says, I'm going through uh, distress over you uh, until Christ is formed in you. Jesus told us in the Great Commission to go and make disciples. Uh, he didn't say just go and get them into the kingdom and then move on to the next one. He said, go and make disciples. How do you make disciples? You teach them at a younger age to grow up. Teach, you teach them so that they can grow. Spend time, Spend time with them, yeah. Uh, Jesus modeled uh, that for us. And who can tell us how Jesus modeled discipling someone? He, uh, he nursed them in their faith and all. Nourish them in their faith. Not only, not, only did he, not only did he perform miracles, he also served. Okay, okay he example. served. An example. An example. Yeah. yeah. Who did he disciple? Three of them off at a time or something like that. So yeah, he would take three off uh, his inner circle with Peter, James, and John. Uh, but he discipled those 12 guys for three years. He spent time with them. Uh, they lived with him. They ate with him. They traveled together, uh, not like we travel today. How did they travel? Wow. On foot. <laughs> or a boat. Uh, either on foot or on a boat. Uh, yeah, we, when we think about going somewhere, we rarely think about walking <laughs> there, do we? No. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, Jesus gave us an example of what discipling someone looks like. And if there is one area in the church today that has been sorely lacking, it is a structured discipleship model. Uh, and that's one of the things I love about Celebrate Recovery is that we have, uh, it's organized into small groups mm -hmm. where we spend time together every week and we have a measure of accountability mm -hmm. with each other and, and it is loaded with instruction along the way. So, uh, so Paul is, is presenting this concept that's been presented before of Christ being formed in you. <clears throat> this, is, this is what uh, is commonly uh, known in church ease language uh, as sanctification, okay? Big word, simple meaning. Uh, Christian maturity, growing in Christ. Now, when we, uh, uh, and this is the work that we're supposed to be involved in between justification and glorification. Another couple of big words, but justification means what? What? When? When is a person justified? At salvation. At salvation. Okay. From the time we are saved till we leave this planet, there is work 
that needs to be going on in our lives. And, and that's what he's, he's referring to here. Uh, until Christ is formed in you. So it's uh, continual. Uh, there, there's no time when <clears throat> we need to take a vacation from working on uh, Christ being formed in us or working on our spiritual maturity, uh, becoming more Christ-like. So uh, let's, let's define that. What does it look like? to become more Christ-like? Actions. Okay, actions. What kind of actions? Also, most discipleship is our going out, you know, as far as in, in works. Works. Uh, your speech. Speech. Okay. All right. Uh, it is, it is, uh, what about sin? Okay, we ought to be moving towards sinning less, although we probably won't ever be sinless. We, we ought to be working on uh, allowing Christ to live out his life rather than our own uh, uh, personal preferences. It, it is becoming more holy. It's becoming... Uh, more like Christ. You remember we, we talked about that in Galatians 2.20 when we got there. Uh, in Galatians 2.20, it says, uh, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but it's not me. It's Christ who is living in me and through me. Uh, so that's what becoming more Christ-like is. It's it's just less of me, more of him, uh, and letting him have his way in our lives. Uh, Matthew and, and Luke both start off their gospels with a description of the Son of God being carried by Mary for nine months. So the Son of God was in her for nine months. And, and then the, uh, 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 the Old Testament in Isaiah says, he shall be called, what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that is from the time that we come to know Jesus, he comes in and takes up residence in our lives. And uh, it's, it's from the beginning to the end. The last, uh, I, I alluded to the uh, uh, Great Commission where Jesus says, go and make disciples. And then he finishes up there. The last words are, and lo, I am with you always. Emmanuel, God with us, when we begin this walk with Jesus, he is with us and in us, and then we have that promise that he will never leave us. He will be with us even to the end of the age. Um, but Paul was, was really concerned about these folks in the churches in uh, Turkey, modern-day Turkey, uh, Galatia. And it was that they were, uh, they were abandoning their focus on uh, a growing in Christ. And the Judaizers had come and said, oh, well, that's not the main thing. The main thing is you got to keep the law. You got to keep the rules uh, that the Jewish fathers have put together. And let me just tell you a little bit about those rules. <clears throat> There, were, there was only one rule at the beginning. In the Garden of Eden, there was only one rule, right? What was that one rule? Don't eat the fruit of that tree. So, 
It, we, well, uh, as, as humanity, we only had one rule to keep. All right? Easy enough, right? We could do that. Mm. Mm. Apparently not. No, apparently not. <laughs> Even when it was just one rule, just one, we couldn't keep the law. Okay? And then uh, Moses came along and gave us ten. Uh, God, through Moses, gave us ten, the Ten Commandments. And then uh, there were other rules about sacrifices and so forth that were added to it uh, to the point that there were 618 of those. Uh, and do you know why the pomegranate is a symbol of, of uh, the Jews? Because if you take 100 pomegranates and count the seeds, there'll be 618 seeds average in a pomegranate. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, but then the church fathers came along and added traditions to the laws to where there were over 2,000 of them. And these Judaizers have come along and said, hey, you got to keep this list of rules if you want to be saved. Uh, and, and, and then Jesus comes along and he basically says, there are really only two. There really are only two that you need to concern yourself with. So what's the first one? Love God, Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And what's the second one? Love, Love your neighbor Love as yourself. yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we, we, we started with one and we couldn't keep it. Now we got, we're, we've expanded, and now we've contracted, and we got two. Uh, love God and love your neighbor. And now what we do comes out of that, okay? But what we do is not a rule. It's not a law. Because what we do in our actions is out of love, uh, so somebody explained to me, why do we try to do right because of love? Who is it that we love, that we're trying to please? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's because we love God, we want to please him. And, and the, the first way we please him is paying attention to the first rule. Okay. Love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength because relationship is the highest form of pleasing God because that's why he created us was to love him because we want to, not because he made us and we have to. How many of you want somebody to love you because they have to? <laughs> No, it's, it's because we choose to. That's the kind of love he wants from us is because we choose to do that. Uh, so Jesus started his earthly uh, uh, presence nine months inside Mary. And then once he left and the Holy Spirit came, we we can spend our lives inhabited by the Spirit of God himself, the God of the universe, uh, Christ in us. So Paul is struggling with this, uh, this notion that the, the, the church members or the folks that have been saved have been distracted by these Judaizers and they've they, they were going in the right direction. They were doing well. And now they've turned and they're not focused on Christ being formed in them. They're not, uh, they're, they're not focused on maturing as Christians and becoming more Christ-like uh, in laying aside sins and, and loving people, loving God and loving each other which is what Christ-likeness is all about. So he's struggling with that. And uh, there, are, there are some churches today that aren't 
as concerned about folks growing in grace, growing in Christ as they ought to be. Uh, happy to have a church full, happy to have accolades for the preacher, uh, happy to have folks uh, uh, talking about their church. But really, the focus of the church ought to be going deeper, going deeper with Christ and, and having him formed in us. Um, so it is living out that Galatians 2.20. It, it's not me anymore. It's Christ living in and through me so that uh, we get to the place where we talk to the Father in terms of <coughs> Daddy, Papa, father uh, so Christ in you uh, that that sets up the next big concern the next big concern is that if Christ is in you that means that my body my physical body is the temple of the Holy Spirit so it's important that I pay attention to not doing anything with my body that would dishonor him in his presence, okay? How much are we in his presence? Always. <laughs> Always. And does he know what you're thinking? Always. Before you do. Yeah. 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 Uh, so that would bear paying attention to, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Our thought life, our physical life, uh, because what we do uh, represents Him. We are representatives of Christ. And the world needs to see more of that. Uh, folks that can love the unlovable, folks that can love those who have different politics from us, those who have different sexual orientation from us, uh, we've got to show people love. We're not going to uh, have an opportunity to share Christ with people if they don't know that we care. They don't care what we know until they know we care, okay? And and they're only going to know we care if we show them love. If we show them love. God dwelling in us. Let's let him shine out of us. That's the hope uh, of, of, of what we bring to the table as the church. So, uh, go back to that verse. My little children, we are children. Uh, and Paul tells us in one place, or the Holy Spirit through Paul, except you become like little children, you'll in no wise enter. Oh, I was Jesus that said that, wasn't it? Except you uh, become as little children, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom. Uh, would do well to remember that. Uh, the innocence of children, uh, uh, believing like children. Uh, I, I keep going back to this in my mind, believing as children. Uh, we have a friend, Beth, who uh, uh, told our grandson, Mason, uh, one time that you, you don't want to eat the inside of the donut. Uh, it'll make you sick. So <laughs> he would eat around it and <laughs> leave the rest of it. So, uh, but they'll believe what you tell them. Uh, so let's be sure to, to tell the truth for sure. Uh, my little children for whom I labor in birth. And that's, that's, a, that's an attitude that we could adopt and do well to, uh, to labor, to concern ourselves, to, to work at uh, helping young Christians develop and, and uh, uh, disciple them, actually, uh, to 
get them to the place that Christ is formed in you. Uh, we, we had a chance this week to go uh, to a meeting over in Blunt County, Alabama, where my oldest brother, our oldest living brother, uh, was uh, a teacher and a coach, a principal. And uh, we went to a, a uh, recovery setting where they had uh, a worship service on a Wednesday night. There were about 150 people in the, in the room. And it, it was it was beautiful, but what was what was beautiful was uh, uh, as we were walking around, they they treated my brother like he was a rock star because he loved those kids, and he worked at rescuing kids in trouble his whole teaching and coaching career. So uh, uh, it was it was known. That, and he still does it today as he teaches a uh, Bible study on Wednesday morning for the same group and, and has a meeting in his home on Sunday nights with some of the guys. Uh, but Christ formed in you. That's our concern. That's our concern. First, it starts with introducing people to Jesus. We had three that were saved this week in Celebrate Recovery. Woohoo! That was awesome. Uh, so... They were introduced to the Savior. Now it is incumbent upon us to work with them, to grow them uh, so that Christ is formed in them, that their walk from salvation to the time they leave this world, that they get closer and closer to Jesus along the way. Oh, and that's where we want to go too, isn't it? That's where we want to go. We want to get closer and closer to Jesus. So until Christ is formed in you, uh, and then he closes with I, I, this, this next verse, I, I, I'd like to be with you uh, so that I could change my tone. Uh, he says, because I've got doubts about you. Uh, you, you've headed off in a direction that's not good. And I wish I could be there to bring you back, uh, but he couldn't. And so the letter has to serve the purpose. And in uh, these remaining chapters of Galatians, he's, Galatians, he's gonna uh, spend time building the case for walking with Christ and growing uh, that presence of Christ living his life out through us uh, more perfectly. So we'll, we'll be uh, beginning in verse 22 next week and go through the end of the chapter and, and, and take a look at, at uh, the beginnings of that. Let's, uh, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time together, uh, for your word, for the fact that Christ is being formed in us and that uh, we are making progress in our walk from salvation to glorification, uh, from our introduction to you to our leaving this world. May we make a difference in multiple lives along this journey, and we'll give you the honor and the glory because it'll be you that does it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.